Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining us to, in today's webinar. Um, I want to welcome you to this particular webinar that's on violent crime. I'm Faye Taxman. I'm a university professor at the Shar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. I also direct a center for advancing correctional excellence, looking at national policies and practices that affect um, crime and also affect people with behavioral health disorders. Um, I also happen to be the co-chair of the JCPA Criminal Justice Reform Initiative along with my colleague, Bruce Turnbull. And this is part of a series that we've been having over the last year and a half um, to really focus our attention on what is the nature of our criminal need for criminal legal reform, criminal justice reform, what are some of the issues. Um, and so in today's um, you know, session, we're really going to talk about the uptake in violent crime as one of those factors that you know, we need to come to terms with. We're also going to be looking at how to actually use this as a moment to focus our attention on rebuilding communities and looking for non-justice responses that could actually help prevent violence and also prevent crime. Um, in this session, we're gonna look at why violent crime has risen. And I've asked my dear colleague, Dr. Rick Rosenfeld from the University of Missouri at St. Louis to enlighten us with the statistics. We're going to look at what are some of the different options and responses. And I've asked um, Dr. Alex Baccaro from the University of Miami, chair of the sociology department, and probably known as the most prolific um, researcher with almost 500 plus publications um, uh, to give us, to enlighten us as to what some of the options are. And then Pastor Lewis Stryker uh, was invited for his insight in terms of how to have, uh, install more of an, uh, you know, a anti-violence norms within um, underprivileged communities and to look at other ways that we could respond to this particular crisis that we're in. Um, I want to thank uh, JCPA for the work that we've been able to do in these web webinars and conversations. As many of you know, JCPA is a national network of Jewish organizations that are focused on community relationships. We're really excited because there's over 125 local JCRCs and 16 national organizations that come together that try and grapple with the hard, difficult, pressing issues of today. And we lurked, work together to focus on social justice um, and issues related to a pluralistic America that fights re racism, anti-Semitism, and hate in the public square. Um, so as I indicated today, we're going to be talking about violence. I wanted to let you know that, you know, as a criminologist, I focus much of my work on the individuals and how to help people that are involved in the justice system get the appropriate level of care. Um, in order to address the drivers of people being involved in the justice system. But we're in a really important moment. Um, and that moment is looking at what non-justice, what non-legal system factors can we use um, to address crime and the crime producing elements. So, um, so I do want to reference to everyone, I'm going to put in the chat box, a recent publication that Dr. Pacaro was involved with um, from the John Jay Research Center on uh, an evaluation center on reducing violence without police, a review of research and evidence. This is a really important um, document because it basically makes the case for a number of different initiatives that could actually address some of the pressing issues that we've confronted. Um, and to a large extent, to be honest, we haven't really adequately addressed um, over the last uh, 40 years. Um, so with that, I am now going to turn over the panel to Dr. Um, Rosenfeld. He's going to give us an overview of, you know, what's, what are the numbers behind the uptake in violent crime and what is it that um, we should be thinking about. So thank you. Turn it over to you, Dr. Rosenfeld. Thank you, Faye. Um, 
uh, just let me uh, share my screen. Haya? You should be all set. Okay. Try that one more time. I get a note, hi, uh, uh, I just changed you to co-host if you wanna try again. Got it, thank you. Okay. And Rick, you need to go in presentation mode. I will. Soon as okay, sorry for the delay. So I'm going to talk about um, crime rate changes uh, over now the last year and a half um, that um, I've been summarizing in a series of reports uh, for the Council on Criminal Justice. You can see uh, at the bottom of the screen two of the most recent reports. Actually, our most recent report was just released at the end of last week, and it follows changes in 10 different crime types across a couple of dozen cities uh, through the third quarter of this year from the beginning of 2018. Third quarter of this year, of course, ended uh, at the end of September. Most of what I have to say, however, uh, is going to be based on changes through the first half of this year. Um, so I'm going to look at weekly crime changes for 10 different offense types, both um, violent crime, property crime, very briefly, and also drug offenses. Uh, and the main findings are these. Uh, last year, as I'm sure it comes as a little surprise to most of you, uh, violent uh, homicides uh, rose very sharply. Uh, in 34 cities we looked at, uh, homicide rates were up in 29 of them, and the average percentage increase in just that year, 19 to 20, was just a little over 30%. Uh, so uh, well over a thousand more deaths uh, due to homicide in those 34 cities than the year before. Uh, we've, uh, in subsequent studies, we found fortunately that the homicide increase has slowed uh, into 2021. And in fact, our most recent report shows that from January through the end of September this year, homicides were just 4% higher than they were during the same period last year. Uh, so it looks like, um, barring um, another, uh, for example, uh, police use of force incident that goes viral and sparks uh, major protest demonstrations, it looks like that crime rates, uh, homicide in particular, are beginning to uh, resume their pre-pandemic levels, but in many cities, those levels are much, much too high. Gun assaults, uh, uh, serious assaults committed with a firearm, although the firearm need not have been discharged during the incident, they also rose, but they have been going up uh, for several years. We don't see a notable increase last year over years before. Really, the big increase last year was in homicide. Even so, the homicide increase didn't erase the long-term drop in homicide and other serious crime we've seen since the early 1990s. Uh, uh, in 2020, uh, there were uh, just over 11 homicide deaths per 100,000 residents in the cities that we looked at. And uh, in 1995, uh, uh, the rate was over 19 per 100,000. So that long-term drop has not disappeared. Uh, very briefly, I know this, uh, this session is focused on violent crime, but it is important to uh, point out that property and drug crimes fell uh, sharply uh, in 2020. 
uh, uh, home burglaries down 24%, uh, larcenies down 16%, drug offenses down 30% over the previous year. I'm going to look at explanations for these changes and then end with some recommendations for uh, policy and strategy. So very, I'm going to move through this very quickly. Uh, the session is being recorded. You can review the recording. I'm also happy to share these slides with anyone who would like to see them. Here you see the increase in homicide. Um, from the beginning of 18 through June of 21. And you can see there's a big spike. Uh, it looks like it uh, occurs right in June. Actually, in most cities, it began in the last week of May 2020. And then we see some uh, decline through uh, the rest of that year and into the current year. Um, I don't expect you to look at all this. Again, the slides will be available, but here are the cities we looked at. And as you can see, in many of those cities, the increases were really quite substantial. For example, an 85% increase in Milwaukee, a 63% increase in Seattle, a 55% increase in Chicago. 37% increase in LA all the way down. Just a few cities registered no increase uh, last year in homicide of the 34 cities we looked at. Uh, here is the gun assault rate of, you know, like other street crimes, there's a strong cyclical pattern. Uh, gun assaults as well as homicides tend to be up during the warmer months and decline during the cooler months. Uh, uh, there is uh, an increase over the prior seasonal peak uh, during the period of the pandemic, uh, but really that increase is in line with a longer term increase in gun assault. Um, this is domestic violence. Alex may have more to say about domestic violence. He uh, participated in a study of several studies of domestic violence showing during the first uh, months of the pandemic, domestic violence rates were up in a number of cities. We have not shown an increase in domestic violence in our data. Now the domestic violence data we were able to obtain, uh, we can only get for 13 cities, so we have to exercise some caution here. Also, it's very, very probable uh, that during the height of the pandemic, uh, uh, persons who were subject to domestic violence were uh, unlikely or less likely to be able to report that to the police because they were in effect sequestered in their homes with their abusers. And as those reports the police went down, uh, we're, we rely on police reports for our data. So we don't show a change in levels of domestic violence. Uh, but that could be to a small sample or to a uh, reduction in reports to the police. Um, robbery rates went down during the pandemic, as did uh, home burglary rates, as I mentioned, and larceny rates. Uh, the exception among the property crimes is motor vehicle theft. Motor vehicle theft was up uh, during 2020, and, and that increase persisted into the current year. Um, why would motor vehicle theft be up, whereas, say, home burglary is down? Well, if more people are spending time at home because they're not at work, they're not parking their cars in a secure parking lot, they're parking their cars perhaps on the street by their house, and that makes the car uh, a more attractive target for uh, motor vehicle uh, theft. Uh, it's also the case that uh, motor vehicles are in motor vehicle thefts, I should say, are increasingly accompanied by uh, changes in violent crime. And it's been suggested that motor vehicle theft has become a so-called keystone crime. That is, it's a crime that's committed to facilitate the commission of other crimes. So a car is stolen and then that stolen vehicle is used in, uh, uh, let's say a drive-by shooting, uh, and then the car is quickly abandoned. So some motor vehicle thefts may have gone up simply because violence was increasing homicide in particular. 
Uh, and as I mentioned, drug offenses, most of which uh, are uh, reported as part of a drug arrest, drug offenses were way down during the pandemic. Very briefly, the pan, uh, during the period of the pandemic and since, uh, we've seen increases in homicide in particular. They, those increases tend to be concentrated in the very same communities. Uh, where historically homicide rates have been higher. Communities subject to racial disparities, segregation, high levels of poverty and underemployment. There's little evidence uh, from jurisdictions across the country that firearm violence is spreading to population groups or areas where it has traditionally been uh, infrequent. I can't go through all the explanations that have been offered, but uh, clearly the pandemic produced changes in everyday activities. And many of those changes resulted in my view in reductions in, especially in property crimes. If people are at home, uh, bur home burglaries tend to go down because burglars tend to avoid occupied households. It's been argued that um, de-policing due to the pandemic or other reasons might have spurred increases in some types of crime. It's been argued by me and others that uh, community legitimacy, that is the legitimacy of the police in the eyes of members of certain communities uh, diminishes during a period of widespread spread protests over police violence. That too could have contributed to the increase. There are more guns on the street. Uh, drug overdose levels, which had been coming down the previous couple of years, shot up again during uh, the pandemic. And drug-related homicides may well have increased. And then there's simply the sheer stress and strain of the pandemic that could have motivated uh, more killings. We need urgent action. Even though the homicide increase appears to be slowing, homicide rates, uh, as I'm sure you understand, remain much, much too high in most American cities. My own view is that uh, so-called proactive, smart, preventive, protective policing needs to be redoubled but it needs to be uh, increased in a way that does not uh, generate community complaints about unfair policing. Uh, uh, various violence reduction strategies that some of which involve police, some of which do not have been grouped under the uh, rubric group, the group violence reduction strategy that a number of cities are engaged in now. Uh, and those strategies appear to be effective. And then social service interventions, such as hospital visits to gunshot victims, also should be increased. This has to happen at the same time that we try to improve police community relations, especially with disadvantaged communities of color. That will have to involve, in my view, redirecting certain activities to other agencies whose personnel are better able to handle, for example, drug overdose or the day-to-day -day problems in living of the homeless. And it, of course, has to uh, uh, involve increased police accountability for proven misconduct. With that, let me stop, Faye, and uh, turn it back to you. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to transition now to uh, Dr. Pacero, who will give us an overview of other options um, regarding, uh, you know, how we should respond effectively to issues related to violent crime. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, I assume everybody can hear me and see my slides okay? Okay, great. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, great to uh, follow Rick and uh, thank you very much, Faye, for the uh, invitation and as well looking forward to hearing the pastor uh, in a few minutes after I go through my, my slides. Um, so I have no numbers and figures, though, although I like numbers and figures. Um, Faye wanted me to talk about myths and truths, and I added, or at least some facts uh, with respect to um, violence and violence prevention. First of all, let's talk about some myths and problems. Uh, local leaders, and uh, like many of you in the in audience uh, and myself over the course of my career, um, they have a, a sense of what they think the challenge is, but they don't always understand what the challenge is in, in large part because they don't really talk to the people who are living in those communities. 
some leaders focus on the wrong things, such as emphasizing juvenile crime, while the majority of gun violence actually involve adults. Others fail to focus at all, only considering root causes and structural factors. Finally, many believe their local violence problem to be unique. So what's true in Miami is different from St. Louis, it's different from Alexandria, Virginia, and different from Kansas City. When in fact, community gun violence behaves quite similarly across jurisdictions. These repeated misunderstandings represent perhaps the single biggest impediment to reducing community violence in cities around the country, aside, of course, from money. Some truths, as Rick alluded to just a few minutes ago, community gun violence is highly concentrated. Research repeatedly finds that crime and especially violence concentrates among small networks of people and places. And everybody's who, in, your, in your city that you're in today, I'm sure you can say this part of the city is where a lot of violence and a lot of the homicide is concentrated. Interventions addressing concentrations of violence have the strongest short-term impact. These strategies are associated with most immediate, measurable, and concrete anti-violence outcomes, fewer homicides, and gun-related injuries have something in common. They focus on small numbers of people and places that are disproportionately involved in violence. These include immediate, immediate policing efforts, such as problem-solving analysis that identifies hot places, hot people, and hot times. So what's going on in a particular city where particular people are congregating in particular buildings or establishments or areas of the city? Implementation of hot spots, policing, random and quick patrols, and focus deterrence strategies are things that the policing side of violence prevention can do. There are caveats, of course, I think Rick alluded to this. Cities employing an intense focus on violent concentration should not be misinterpreted as a call for more enforcement oriented approaches. There are several non-enforcement strategies that can successfully engage those individuals who are at elevated risk for violence in elevated areas for violence. Also, enforcement-oriented strategies are best when they're narrowly tailored to minimize any negative collateral consequences. Emphasizing strategies with short-term results should also not be misconstrued as an argument against early prevention measures, such as family training and home visitation programs, which can be a cost-effective means for controlling future crime and violence. Economist Mark Cohen uh, of Vanderbilt University and I estimated how much money society would save if we could prevent one high-risk youth from a lifelong of crime, it was upwards of $2 million. These strategies can and should complement one another. We need both policing and especially non-policing strategies. I'm gonna review some of these here uh, based upon my work with uh, the, um, Mayor Eric Johnson in Dallas, where I was on his task force for safe communities that was a task with identifying non-police interventions, as well as my work here with Miami-Dade County Mayor uh, Daniela Levine Cava, which also focused on non-policing strategies, as well as the work I've done with Jeff Butts at John Jay, as well as the Council on Criminal Justice. I'm going to review a couple of these. Some of you may be familiar with them. I'm just going to highlight at a 35,000 foot level, kind of what, what we know about some of the, the best non-policing strategies. Number one, cognitive behavioral therapy. This teaches people to manage emotions, address conflicts constructively, and think carefully before taking actions. All of us feel stress. All of us feel anger. The question is, in that situation, how do we talk ourselves down from that and away from that? These are typically conducted in group settings. They can help even the highest risk individuals improve their thinking and behavior in order to avoid crime and violence. Rick alluded to uh, gun violence interrupters, also called uh, gang violence interrupters. This is basically involves outreach by credible messengers. These could be uh, ex-gang members or people who are uh, returning from, the, uh, from prison, who live in the community, who grew up in those communities, who know those communities. And they talk with individuals who are at high risk for violence. And this is an important component of many models for reducing community violence. Got lots of different names around the country right now, but they all kind of do the very similar thing. Violence interruption, intervention, street outreach programs, these recruit people to mediate disputes. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to solve the, the problem from getting bigger. And if it's, if it's a fight, we don't want it to be solved with a gun. That's we're trying to intervene at the local ground level before someone does something they wish they would not do. 
Hospital-based uh, violence intervention programs are really, really unique. They're, they're, they're starting to grow in popularity and scaling out, but these combine the efforts of medical staff and community partners to provide additional services and care to those at the highest risk for repeat injury. So these are individuals who are, go to the hospital uh, or the ER for a gunshot wound, and right there you start addressing some of their needs. They aim to intervene during crucial, quote, teachable moments of an individual's recovery from a violent incident while leveraging the trust and goodwill afforded to caregivers. These programs may provide conflict mediation, crisis management, home visitation, case management, mentorship, and other services while the individual is still getting their medical care. And again, this involves non-policing uh, individuals working in the hospitals. Then there's something that I always consider to be low-hanging fruit, environmental crime prevention. Uh, these strategies inhibit crime and violence and disorder by altering the physical environments of locations. These place-based approaches involve addressing blight, adding street lights, and changing foot and car traffic patterns, among other measures. This can be implemented literally right now uh, in all of your major cities. Uh, when, in Dallas, this is one of our four main recommendations, and the mayor was able to generate a lot of money from philanthropic foundations to improve street lighting in certain sections of Dallas. I'm sure in every community you all are in, there's places that are really dimly lit that could use a few, a few lights and um, some, some uh, improvements to those areas. Again, this is not one of these. This is all of these. And you got to remember, it is not one little thing that's going to solve this problem. It's a, a series of these different efforts. Finally, I want to highlight early family parent training programs. Um, these are extremely, extremely effective. And again, there's different kinds of these. There's the nurse home visitation programs, there's Stop Now and Plan out of Canada, there's the Incredible Years, there's the Triple P Parenting Program. All the programs do the, exactly the same thing. They work with new parents, primarily mothers, with respect to child rearing strategies, assistance with education and employment for the mother, as well as healthcare for the mother and the child. The long-term evaluations of this is absolutely crystal clear. They improve the kid's self-control, and they reduce the kid's delinquency, crime, and number of sexual partners, drug use, alcohol use, increased educational attainment, increased employment prospects, and increases in social skills, training, and development. The bottom line, we need a crime and violence prevention strategy that is not either or. This is not either the police or the non-police. This is both strategies, and we want them to be integrated and coordinated. So that's ideal uh, in the real world for such a coordinated effort it would be beneficial to have people in the policing sector and the non-policing sector to make the strategies work and to work on these things together simultaneously. We need short, medium, and long-term benchmarks and aspirations. We may know what we want to do right now. We may know what we want to do five years from now. So what are those benchmarks and what are we going to aspire to? You know, in, in football parlance, you don't aspire to be eight and eight. You aspire to be 16 and 0. So we got to do measurable progress over time. Remember, we got to prevent crime for the kids who are 15 years old now, the 10-year-old who in five years will be 15, the five-year-old who in 10 years will be 15, and the kid who's born today who in 15 years is going to be in an at-risk type of age uh, population. So the strategies are right here, right now, and then over time. Again, there's evidence on both sides of the violence and prevention issue. You can and you must do both. Two resources there, and of course, the slides will be shared in the webinar will be available. You just click on the hyperlinks. These are all easy to read, um, very evidence-based. A multitude of, of, of practitioners work on these, as well as scholars from various disciplines as well. Uh, and there's my contact information. If anybody has any questions, always happy to, to reach out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. We greatly appreciate that. Um, and the last speaker, before we open it up, the floor to questions, and I have a couple um, uh, questions myself, um, is Pastor Lewis uh, Straker. Pastor Straker, would you like to take the floor? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And it's an honor and privilege to be with you. I am actually uh, standing in for Pastor Guilford Monroe. He is, uh, he works with the borough president's office and is the uh, clergy liaison for the entire borough there, but he is also the president of the 67th Precinct Clergy Council, affectionately known as the God Squad. And so I am a part of the clergy lead team uh, for the God Squad. And so I'm here 
uh, just listening in and, and participating in this uh, uh, very important panel. And as I listen to the quantitative and the qualitative uh, analysis and in depth from uh, the professors and doctors that are on here, uh, I can definitely feel at home because a lot of the, uh, the, the statistics that they were highlighting and also uh, some of the remedies to cure violence are some of the very things that we are engaged in at uh, the God Squad. And so uh, I would like to talk a little bit about what we do uh, just to help uh, people understand as uh, the last speaker just spoke about talk some of the preventive measures, um, violence interrupters, cure violence models, all of these organizations are necessary. And so at the God Squad, uh, six different priests and clergy council, we are a faith-based organization, and it is comprised of clergy within the confines of the 67 precinct. And our focus is really to lessen the neighborhood tensions between and act as a liaison between the uh, community, our congregation, and we say the cops, so law enforcement. And it, it's so necessary that we have someone to bridge that gap. A lot of times when we have uh, neighborhood tensions, especially uh, dealing with law enforcement or if there's a perceived uh, police brutality issue, there seems to be this wall and there's this divide that the cops are on one side and the community is on the other. And so it's really important that we uh, have the ability to bridge that gap and realize that we're all in this together. When we're dealing with violence in our communities and trying to solve the problems, we have to realize that number one, we cannot arrest our way out of situations. So we deal heavily with gun violence and we realize that you cannot arrest your way out of gun violence. There's only so many jails that we can uh, build and there's so many people that we can lock them. In fact, it, it, economically, it becomes a challenge. I, I heard the very uh, startling uh, number the other day that it takes uh, some close to uh, $400,000 just to incarcerate one individual. Well, what about if those resources were used to try to uh, use preventive measures? And so we talk about intervention, and but also the, the prevention that is necessary to reach uh, our young people, to reach uh, people in general, not just young people, as the analysis was just pointed out uh, in our former speaker, that adults are involved in gun violence and forms of violence as well. But it doesn't just start as an adult. It starts somewhere uh, within the, their childhood. Something has happened to get them to the point of where they are in life. And these are the things that we kind of look at uh, at the God Squad and trying to see how we can help solve the problems and, and the issues surrounding violence, particularly gun violence in our community. So we understand we cannot arrest our way out of this. And one of the things that's so important to know is that violence and pu public safety rather is a shared responsibility. You might've heard that saying going around, but it is very true. It's going to take all of us. It's going to take a community uh, that really cares to do something about it. A lot of times when we go out and there are shootings in our communities, one of the things that we do is we respond. We say that there'll be no shooting that goes unresponded within 24 to 48 hours in our community. We go out and we do a response. One of the things that is disheartening is that many times we're dealing with a shooting incident, whether it's on the spot or uh, it's a response to a shooting that has taken place in the community. And when we get out there, it just seems like it's another day in the community. There is no community involvement. There is no community outrage. There's no community outcry. And so we believe that the same level of passion and the same level of energy when there's a police involved shooting or there's a level of police brutality where our community comes out, we ought to be just as outraged. We ought to be just as vocal when there is a shooting from amongst ourselves. And so what it's really gonna take in order to deal with violence in, in our communities is the first thing we've got to care. We've got to become a community that does not normalize violence, does not normalize these shootings that are taking place. As you saw the statistics, uh, overwhelmingly, the numbers have risen during the pandemic. And we can talk a lot about uh, some of the reasons behind why the upticks, 
But nevertheless, we're in this state where we're seeing people um, dying. We're seeing a lot of violence taking place. And so we've got to get to the root of it. And I believe that uh, when we talk about credible messengers, uh, when we talk about people that uh, need to lend their voices, one, our community needs to step out. We need more community engagement. We need more block associations. We need people taking more authority over their, uh, their blocks and their homes and standing together and saying, not on our watch, making sure that they're doing something to help uh, preserve their home ownership and the values of their properties and also uh, their young people, their, their future leaders, uh, making sure that they are engaging with them, making sure that the village is active. One of the things that are uh, very powerful is the community when the village comes together. And I think in many ways we've lost that. I think in America we have become a very individualistic society where uh, it's all about me, myself, and I. Uh, but really and truly, we've got to get back to the village. We've got to get back to the place where even if mommy and daddy is not around because they're working X amount of hours just to try to make it happen, there's a community of auntie, uncles, neighbors, uh, uh, cousins, friends, people that are coming together to hold uh, each other accountable. And so when you talk about, uh, we were talking about credible messengers a little while ago, I think not only is it the community's response, but I think there's a faith-based response as well. I think some of the most credible messengers that you can find are faith-based leaders. Now, a lot of times people look at us and we say, well, you know, you guys are uh, people that live by the book and uh, you've probably lived clean lives your entire life. Well, that is not the truth. Many of the faith leaders and the pastors and the people that you see around, they've been through some things in life but they credit their faith in, in God or uh, whatever their religion that, that they believe in as having the power to turn their lives around. And so when you think about credible messengers, I think about the role of faith-based leaders, our pastors, our imams, our rabbis, and the voices that they have in our communities. So our communities have always uh, in, in the past rallied around uh, our churches, our synagogues, our mosques. Uh, in times of difficulties and trials. I know for the uh, Black church experience how important the church was, uh, definitely dealing with racial oppression and, and, and the issues and inequities in our societies. And so somewhere along the line, I think we have lost uh, uh, the strength of the faith-based community. But what we're doing at the God Squad is so important that clergy is saying, listen, it is our time to get out of the four walls of our churches and to get into these streets and to just let people know that we care and to find ways not just to meet with them when there's a shooting, not just to, as we do at the God Squad, uh, perform funeral services uh, free of cost and uh, have our mother's support group, Mothers for Safe Cities, that will support the mothers and the families that are grieving the loss. But, but we also have to think of preventive measures. And this is why at the God Squad, we've started uh, with the, uh, along with the Rohan Levy Foundation, the Flatbush Leadership Academy, taking young people that may be at risk or just young people that uh, are just left open. You, we have a saying in our church world that the devil finds work for idle hands. And a lot of times when we see our young people getting into all kinds of activities, it's simply because they don't have anything to do. There's the lack of resources in our communities. There's a lot of things that are you know, struggles that are happening. And this is why we were very proud to have this summer over a hundred young people that we hired through our summer in, uh, youth employment program. That's a hundred young people that would have been idle during the summer, during the summer break from school, but their hands were active. They were active in the community, getting involved, doing, uh, working on various projects. But then also our Flatbush Leadership Academy, where we're training and developing young people, training their minds to become leaders, pairing them with mentors and giving them hope. And I think a lot of times when you see people that are dealing with uh, violence and these kinds of issues, uh, somewhere along the line, they've lost hope. And when I look at what's happening in our inner cities, a lot of our young people feel like there's no hope. They feel like the only way out of their poverty, the only way out of their living uh, conditions is to be involved in some type of illegal activity. But when we provide hope 
to young people, when we provide and we catch them from a young age, you'll be surprised how their lives can be redirected, how they can see themselves as becoming productive citizens in society. So it's really going to take all of us to come together. I believe there has to be a righteous response to what is happening here, not just a community response, but that faith leaders play a strong role in helping shape the minds and the moral compass of our societies. And so we join in with all of the statisticians. We join in with uh, those that are on this panel and those that in, uh, in the organizations that are fighting to help restore our society. It's going to take all of us, uh, not just law enforcement, but the community as well. And so uh, when we talk about these things, we got to act on these things. And the God Squad is very active I'm proud to be a part of this organization and uh, Pastor Monroe is doing a phenomenal job. We've now started expanding the model that we do in the God Squad to cities around the country. So we now have our clergy for safe cities where we're trying to replicate our models. We have seen reductions in gun violence because of the activities that are beyond just policing, but community engagement. And I believe we have to get the village back now that we're opening back up, I know that the pandemic did a number on us, but we're opening back up. And I believe we can reduce the violence if we just begin to take a holistic approach to dealing with the issues that are plaguing our communities and our society as a whole. Thank you. Um, thank you all very much. Uh, so I have two questions. I've been monitoring the chat. So there's a lot of heavy discussion going on in the chat. We thank our audience for always being so engaged. Um, but my first question is uh, fathers. So this comes from the chat. There was a lot of discussion, primarily, Alex, when you were talking about the um, you know, nursing, uh, nursing program uh, for mothers. Uh, but there was a questions that came out. What about fathers? What should we be doing about fathers in particular? Um, and I know in, you know, in my own work um, dealing with reentry issues, trying to really help people reestablish themselves as part of the family union is very important in terms of better success um, for individuals. But Alex, what are some of your thoughts about fathers? Yeah, um, well, um... I'm, I'm very fortunate to have mine still, um, and he was a, a huge influence on my life. Um, so, um, you know, the, er, the early nurse home visitation programs, those programs that started in Elmira, New York over 30, 40 years ago, they were focused on mothers. The programs more generally about early family parent training programs that are designed to give parents skills to help socialize their children involve both parents, if there are both parents in, in the situation household broadly defined. Um, I have no doubt in my mind about the importance of connecting fathers, establishing those relationships and reconnecting them. Um, and there are several of those programs that exist. They haven't been as evaluated as much as the nurse home visitation programs are. Um, but I think undoubtedly, I think most people would agree that um, the, the, the beneficial impact of, of that for you. Yeah, I, I want to remind our audience, um, because there's a lot of chatter that, you know, this issue about, um, you know, two parent families, uh, you know, and, you know, trying to bring fathers back into the household. That's an, it's an important issue, but let's remember that our social policies of the 1960s with the war on poverty actually drove the reason that there is, you know, um, more fragmentation among families um, who are impoverished. Um, and we, this was a deliberate social policy and we're now recouping from, you know, that's 60 years ago, but we're still recouping from that particular year. And I think it's important, I, I know in my classroom, I always remind the students that, you know, we can, you know, vilify certain people for certain sort of situations, but you have to remember the historical roots of our social policies. And I think one of the important pieces that we need to think about is how do we unravel that particular social policy? Because it still exists in many different ways. I mean, 
people who talk about the impact of mass incarceration and coerced mobility talk about it from this fact that it's really forcing men out of neighborhoods and households. And we know the collateral impact of that. So um, any suggestions on social actions that we could take to kind of reverse some of the not so, you know, what we thought was reasonable policies in the 1960s that actually have come back to haunt us in some ways? Oh, Rick, we can't hear you. Uh, yeah, uh, well, I've done research and others have as well, looking across societies uh, at the relationship between serious crime, usually it's homicide rates, and the strength of the social, what we here call the social safety net in those societies, the strength of, of programs that provide assistance to uh, parents, uh, families, and individuals. And there's a clear relationship in those societies where uh, the welfare state is more extensive uh, and more generous, other things equal, we tend to see lower homicide rates. So if you're asking for social policies that appear on a society-wide basis to help moderate homicide rates, uh, then a more extensive social safety net would be a collection of those uh, policies. And you know, I have to mention that there is legislation under debate right now at the federal level to expand our safety net. Thank you. Um, any other comments? So, um, all right. So, uh, Tammy, do you want to draw from some of the other um, questions? Sure, sure. So we have someone in the chat who wants to know more about some of the data presented. Um, and they specifically wanted to know if drug offenses were down um, in part because users were actually inside doing drugs rather than doing them in public um, where they could be seen and apprehended by law enforcement. Um, yeah, I'll take that one. And the answer is clearly yes. Uh, although drug transactions had been moving indoors have been for some years uh, prior to the pandemic, but I think clearly that increased during the pandemic. A lot of drug transactions, however, remain outdoors. And when there are fewer people on the streets, think of the height of the pandemic uh, last summer. Um, when there are fewer people on the street, there are simply fewer transactions. Also, the police in many cities, especially uh, in places where uh, marijuana has been decriminalized, uh, have been prioritizing away from enforcement of at least low-level drug offenses. And as there, because there is less enforcement, fewer police community contacts over drugs, and uh, so that drug offense rate will go down for that reason alone. Um, but, you know, the major point, I think, is well taken. Yeah, as drug transactions move inside, uh, they're less likely to come to police attention. Thank you. Uh, great. Thank you. And, and you touched on this, but also, um, you know, prioritizing arrests to reduce uh, the population numbers inside jails. So reducing kind of the low level crime arrests. Right. Uh, or there's uh, little question that that is uh, on the proposal stage or is happening in, in several cities. Um, and um, I think, uh, uh, you know, the immediate purposes are to reduce uh, COVID related problems in correctional facilities. But uh, but uh, correctional reformers have been arguing for some time that we ought to find ways of dealing with lower level offenses without willy nilly incarcerating people uh, in, in, in local jails. Um, I would say just this, uh, I'm a fan of that movement. Uh, I think it should be, proceed, but proceed carefully. Uh, we don't want laws on the books that go unenforced in practice. So if we're serious about reducing the enforcement of violations of certain low-level offenses, we need to rethink whether those offenses are on the books anyway. 
It's not good for um, uh, criminal justice in the United States to leave laws on the books that uh, for whatever reason, uh, a community has decided they do not want to see enforced in practice. So another great question um, that we have is uh, if you guys could expand on the kind of programs that you're thinking of when you talk about expanding the social safety net. Well, uh, just one, uh, it's, you know, it's uh, under uh, current discussion. Uh, and that is, uh, uh, well, a whole set of programs that provide resources to families whose children are very young. Uh, those programs make it more likely that the kind of early interventions that Alex talked about and that have proven to be so effective uh, can become more widespread. So programs that provide resources to families with very, very young children seem to me to be a priority with respect to expanding the social safety net. So I'd like to add one of my more favorite um, suggestions, which is, you know, for people who fall under the poverty line, they spend almost 70% of their income on rent. Some spend more. Um, and um, for anyone who's interested, um, Matthew Desmond wrote a book called Evicted. It was published several years ago, but it gives a great tale of what happens to people who have housing instability. And his recommendation is basically this notion that we should actually supplement so that people don't get into that state of housing instability, but actually be able to supplement their incomes so that they get down to about 30%, which is what is the norm in terms of what people should spend. And by doing so, we'd, force a lot, we'd help a lot of people from moving further into impoverished settings and also more, um, more stability in their lives for schooling, for food, et cetera. Um, so I think, you know, looking at our housing policies, and I'd also add healthcare. Alex. Yeah, let me lower my hand. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think, I think um, you know, the, the, the bills that are under discussion in Washington, D.C., um, I think it's it's very clear, and I think that you know the pastor said it really eloquently is is they're about investing in people. We can be much smarter on crime by being much smarter on people and in places where those people live. Investing now is my my dad used to change our oil because we were really uh, poor growing up, and he used to have a, an oil company called Quaker State, and they had this advertisement that says you can pay me now or you can pay me later. And so I think these kinds of social safety net things, this isn't about Democrats or Republicans, this is about being smart and about being you know, inclusive of people and us as a collective. And this isn't being Pollyannish, this is being real because the investments we make now, we're gonna pay for them one way or the other. Hopefully we're not paying for them out of you know, society's pockets and society's lives 18 years from now. So I think that those kinds of safety nets um, are about investing in our future. And I, I like to add in, you know, we're, we're only as strong as the, the weakest link. And the reality is uh, when we have people that are, are struggling and, and, and suffering in America, it hurts all of us. And so it's important, as uh, Dr. Alex just said, we, we have to invest in so many areas. There's so many areas of inequities that are, uh, uh, we have to deal with, not just uh, from an economic standpoint, but also educationally. You see the difference in the schooling districts. Uh, not only that, healthcare. You, you see that, and even produce. The, the groceries in certain neighborhoods and the nutrition that people are getting in certain neighborhoods are different from others. And so all of these are factors, whether we want to believe it or not, into violence and the things that we're seeing today. So there are a number of things that we have to look at not just at the fruit of uh, the, the, the rotten fruit of violence, but also the root of some of the things that are, have created uh, the inequities and uh, the disruption in people's lives that they have resorted to extreme measures. Thank you. Tammy, we have a few more minutes. Do you have another uh, question? 
Yeah, um, well, I have a number of questions. I'll go with one that I, I don't think will be too, uh, will take too long for you guys to answer. Um, and this is on gun buyback programs and how effective they really are. Um, I'll take uh, a stab at that one. I um, uh, have studied uh, gun buyback programs, their effectiveness. Uh, if the objective is to reduce community level gun violence, gun buyback programs are not effective. Buyback programs though, uh, as I think reflected in the very question are quite popular. Uh, they receive a great deal of publicity. And uh, to the degree that a buyback program, which receives a, a great deal of attention, can shine a light on other community programs, many of which we've discussed uh, uh, on this panel, uh, then the publicity associated with the buyback may do some good. But the buyback programs themselves uh, do not reduce crime. We found in our study uh, that a chief reason people were uh, selling their guns uh, was to get money to buy a new gun. I, I have to agree with uh, Dr. Richard. Uh, the gun buyback by, uh, buy programs are more of a band-aid on a deep wound. And uh, the, the reality is uh, we have more guns than we can handle in America. I believe there's 122 guns for every 100 uh, persons in, in America. And so we have a fascination with guns, unfortunately. And until we do something about the iron pipeline, until we do something about the proliferation of guns, not just uh, these uh, heavy artillery guns, but even the handguns, we have a major handgun problem. And so just taking off a few guns off the street might look like we're doing something, but not everything that we're doing that, you know, is, is uh, uh, sometimes we mistake activity for productivity. And uh, the reality is just taking a few handguns off the street is not going to solve the problem. And even if we've got guns off the street, the, the, the real issue is deeper than the weapon itself. I always say this, and this is why I believe that a righteous response from faith base is important, because really what you have is a heart problem. You can take away the gun, but even what we're seeing in New York City, stabbings and slashings are up. So someone who has uh, violence or anger or rage inside of their heart is going to find something else to, to create their or commit their acts of violence. What it really needs is a change of the heart and a change of the mind. And we've got to get to the root of these things. Well, we're at the end of our hour. I really want to pre um, thank the panel. I appreciate so much the time that our, the panel has given to this important discussion. I also appreciate the insights that the panel has offered um, for us to really think about what kind of society do we want to have and how do we really create this heart that uh, Pastor Stoker has talked about, you know, where we actually do have a greater need to uh, help other people. I mean, just historically, you know, the United States has, we've kind of shied away from the social welfare state for a lot of reasons, um, and which, you know, we don't have time to go into today. Um, and mainly, I think that because it's named social welfare, um, we, you know, there's a reluctance for us to really think about that as a, a framework and model. But there's, there's a lot of goodness that happens when we care for other people. Um, so again, I want to thank uh, Dr. Picaro, Dr. Rosenfeld, and Pastor Steiker for their participation today. And I want to thank everyone for listening. And uh, you have our email addresses, so feel free to contact us and uh, JCPA will be providing the slides and a copy of the session. Thank you much. Take care. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.